It can fly at 27 times the speed of sound. Russia says its newly deployed avant-garde missile is the world leader in hypersonic weapons. So how will it affect the global arms race? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Deri Nabugeza. Russia says its new hypersonic weapon is a technological breakthrough on the scale of Sputnik, the first satellite launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. President Vladimir Putin says the avant-garde can easily bypass missile defense systems on its way to a target through sharp maneuvers. And that's worrying the U.S. that's also having to contend with China's development of hypersonic arms. Beijing displayed the Dongfeng-17 at a military parade in October. And the U.S. Defense Secretary has said developing the technology is a priority. Well, President Putin says Moscow is no longer playing catch-up. If we want to be victorious, our equipment must be better than the equipment of other countries. It's not a game of chess where we can put up with a draw. Our equipment must be the best. We can strive for that. We are striving for that in key development areas. So let's have a closer look at Russia's new weapon. While well, the avant-garde is launched on top of an intercontinental ballistic missile. But unlike a regular missile warhead, it can swerve sharply, making it much harder to intercept. President Putin says the avant-garde can withstand temperatures of up to 2,000 degrees Celsius and it can carry a nuclear weapon of up to two megatons. The avant-garde can travel at 27 times the speed of sound. Analysts estimate that for China's new system, it's around five times. Let's bring in our guests. Uh, Pavel Felgenhauer is a defense and a military analyst. He's joining us from Moscow. Tarek Rauf is a nuclear arms control specialist. He's joining us from Vienna. We have with us Paul Schultz. He's the former director of proliferation and arms control at the British Ministry of Defense. And he's joining us from London. Thanks very much for being with us on Inside Story. Welcome to all of you, gentlemen. Uh, Pavel, over in Moscow. So Putin had announced this missile back in 2018. But how significant is this deployment today? Uh, well, it's uh, run as, uh, with a lot of hype as a great, great achievement. That uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of kind of PR going out to the Russian public that this puts Russian number one in the world in nuclear armaments. Though, of course, it's not a new missile per se. Uh, it's a very old missile. Actually, the missiles with, on which these uh, avant-garde are deployed are about 30 years old. They were built in the Soviet times, known in the West as SS-19 and in Russia as Ur-100-UTTH. Uh, but so this is an old missile with an innovative uh, warhead, a reentry vehicle. And, just... and yes, this is innovative. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's an important achievement. Uh, though right now it's more, I would say, technical achievement. It doesn't really alter the uh, balance between America and Russia in nuclear weapons. We're going to talk about the, the balance of power in just a moment. But just for clarity's sake, Pavel, um, Russia saying that it's been put into service. What are we to read into those comments? Does it mean that it's actually operational right now or is it still in an advanced phase of field testing? Uh, apparently, there were tests. I mean, these uh, things were tested in Soviet times. The development began also 30 years ago or even 40. Uh, now they reached deployment stage and several silo-based missiles have be, they replaced the uh, uh, original classical uh, uh, re reentry vehicles with this one. Of course, that means that uh, the, S the SS-19 can carry basically up to six separate warheads. When they put an avant-garde on it, it's only one. So actually, it de decreases the number of warheads. Uh, that's why they're deploying just a handful, just several, uh, because right now, uh, well, they're not really uh, militarily needed that much, because America does not have a comprehensive missile defense. So there's nothing to break through much. Uh, ordinary uh, uh, warheads can also reach uh, the United States or Americans reach Russia. So that, uh, the balance is based on that. 
All right. So uh, this is for the future, basically. Tarek Rauf, the, the key word here is hypersonic. How significant is this deployment, in your opinion? Well, it's significant in the sense that we are now starting to see the, a new arms race, particularly in delivery systems. Hypersonic uh, weapons, as was mentioned, can be at least five times the speed of sound. The speed of sound is 350 meters per second, roughly. So these new delivery systems, particularly since they are maneuver maneuverable, and there are two types. There is the avant-garde, which is a hypersonic uh, boost glide vehicle, but there can also be hypersonic powered cruise missiles or powered uh, delivery systems. So these are designed basically by Russia to counter the United States withdrawal in 2002 from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which was a seminal Cold War treaty banning nationwide missile defenses. And then the U.S. has now recently abandoned the Intermediate Range Forces Treaty in, in Europe as well. Uh, plus, in 2003, the U.S. came up with this concept of conventional prompt global strike, which was aimed at delivering a warhead anywhere in the world within 60 minutes of a decision being given. So the Russians, in a sense, are reacting to a number of these uh, developments uh, on the whole. And now with the approval of a space force by President Trump and funding for it given in the U.S. defense budget, we are also now moving the arms competition into space, which would be a very dangerous development. Again, this is something I'm going to ask you about in a moment, but let's just stick with this hypersonic missile for a moment, Tarek. And some are saying that it's not so much the speed of the hypersonic weapon alone that counts, but rather it's the glide vehicle's trajectory, which, quote, surfs along the edge of the atmosphere, and that then could make it impossible to defend against. So how much of a challenge is this for existing systems? It would be a significant challenge for existing systems. The U.S. Uh, technical write-up is that these hypersonic uh, boost vehicles are 10 to 20 times less visible to existing U.S. early warning radars than a traditional re-entry vehicle from a ballistic missile. And as you mentioned, with a very low trajectory and also maneuverability, it would make it very difficult to defend against. Now, that could be point defense, but in order to defend all important targets in the United States, it would be impossible at the current moment. Uh, Paul Schultz in London, what's your reaction to this deployment? Well, uh, let's qualify the, the, the headlines. First of all, we don't know that these things are really going to work. There's, there's an engineering uh, challenge, and the Russian military technology sector is innovative, but it has a number of records of, of failures of, of, of systems underperforming or just blowing up. So we don't know how well these will work. Secondly, um, it's strategically at the moment rather unimportant. Um, as I say at the moment, it, this, that, that could change uh, because the Americans are not trying to defend their, their key points against uh, a peer competitor uh, Russian attack. Their, their, their defense systems are rudimentary. They don't always or mostly work. And they're aimed at small adversaries like North Korea or possibly China, though there's ambiguity on that. So the fact that the, Ameri the Russians are deploying things which in this generation could move in and hit targets and couldn't be defended against is not actually strategically a very big deal. As uh, Mattis, the, the, the last uh, American defense secretary, said, the last one who was able to give a, um, uh, a general effective overview of these things said last year, this, this doesn't really change anything in the strategic equation. And that, I think, is, is true for the moment. What I, but I, what I also think is we should see this as a signal. This is Russia, given the, the, the frantic way that Putin is hyping this up, it's a, it's a way of warning America that it, uh, there is a potentially fast accelerating arms race in prospect unless uh, America does some deal to extend uh, and maybe modify uh, the, the New START Treaty, which Russia wants. And it's not at all clear that America does. There are American opinion makers who, who insist, no, we don't want to be bound by a treaty because we are more technologically competent and anyway the Russians cheat. And I think, um, was it Tarek Ralph's last point about America abandoning the INF Treaty disguises something quite interesting and politically important, because the Americans left the treaty only because they spent seven years pointing out that the Russians were cheating in it. 
And that, that fact is very well inscribed in the minds of the uh, American Congress and DOD and State Department people. So there is a huge problem of credibility, um, mm -hmm. believability in arms control uh, solutions, which would have to be overcome if, if the Stark Treaty is going to be extended. So I think all eyes are on uh, the next president and, and trying to affect the, the opinion of future or the immediately following American administration. Do they want an arms control agreement or not? Okay, stand by for a second. Let's just explain what the START treaty is. So Russia's announcement comes at a time, as we we're saying, when there's only one arms control treaty still standing between Moscow and Washington. The new START treaty is due to expire in February 2021. And it limits both nations' strategic nuclear forces. It also facilitates inspections and exchanges of information. Now, if that treaty is allowed to expire, for the first time since the 1970s, there will be no constraints on U.S. and Russian nuclear forces. And the Trump administration has long criticized the agreement, saying it doesn't limit new nuclear weapons systems planned by Russia. And the U.S. also wants China, that's not bound by any agreement, to limit its arms to be part of a future treaty. Tariq Rof, um, to what extent do you think that Russia is using this uh, sort of deployment to try and pressure the U.S. to open talks and renew uh, that START treaty. Do you, do you see it that way? I think there is some credibility to that, uh, that view. Originally, the Russians said that time was running out to extend the new START treaty because they claimed that the United States is not fully, fully living up to its obligations and it would take a year's negotiations. But within the last few weeks, Moscow has said that they are willing to extend the new START treaty immediately and without any conditions. So there is some desperation I think on the Russian side, and to follow up on what Paul Schulte said, I think the Russians are quite concerned about the American technological prowess should they decide to develop new types of weapons. And just on the INF Treaty, it was the 9M729 cruise missile that the Americans believe uh, Russia made, which is in violation of the INF Treaty. But in return, the Russians also have concerns about U.S. compliance with the INF Treaty. And many observers were not satisfied with the way in which the U.S. handled uh, the Russian issue of noncompliance uh, with this particular cruise missile. So on the whole, again, uh, to echo what Paul said, the atmosphere between Moscow and Washington is deteriorating steadily. And soon we will be facing a world without any nuclear arms control between the two largest possessors of nuclear weapons. And next year, will be the 50th anniversary of this very important nuclear non-proliferation treaty where the nuclear weapon states have uh, undertaken an obligation to reduce their nuclear weapons. And this bodes very badly for this uh, review conference of the non-proliferation treaty next year. Uh, Pavel, how do you see it playing out when it comes to the renewal or not of the, of the START treaty? Well, the new START um, has in it an uh, uh, option to uh, extend it for five years once. And that extension does not require a ratification in the American Senate. But that means it can be only extended. It cannot be re renegotiated or modified, because uh, a modified treaty would require ratification in the American Senate, and that right now is not plausible. I don't think any treaty that uh, pr President Trump signs with President Putin will get a two-thirds majority in the American Senate, no matter what's in that treaty. So there can be only an extension uh, without uh, any kind of modification. There's still a possibility that may happen. Uh, but there's also a possibility that it won't, and we will be, of course, in a free-for-all. And that's uh, rather bad, because there's a real arms race coming up. And if this avant-garde system does not really uh, seriously alter the balance of deterrence between Moscow and Washington, new weapons are, going, are coming up that may very much destabilize the strategic situation, like uh, medium-range, uh, very precise American whip, uh, missiles that are also hyperspeed that may be deployed uh, in Europe or in Asia, and uh, which are going to be not only very accurate, maybe will have the capability to hit moving targets. And this is, will mean that the Russian command centers and Russian silo missiles and mobile missiles could be under attack in several minutes. 
and uh, maybe no time to fire. That means everyone's going to be on a, uh, ready to shoot at any, pro uh, any moment, and that's going to be very, very dangerous. Uh, Paul Schulze, uh, for clarity, um, can you confirm whether right now there are any international agreements on when or uh, how hypersonic missiles are actually used? And if there aren't any, uh, isn't that a danger going forward? There aren't any because it's too new a technology and the international mood between Russia and America and incidentally China has not made it possible to begin serious negotiations on how you would handle this new technology. And it would need to be put in the context of other changes like uh, artificial intelligence and space, uh, you know, space-based assets and how they might repercuss on a strategic exchange. So this is, um, it, it's a huge raft of technical and diplomatic and political problems that need to be uh, looked at together. So and why has that policy process not hasn't kept started up with because the... the politics are wrong. Right, so well, you're saying it's just that there's a lack of political will and that's why policy hasn't kept up with the pace of uh, technological There's a lot of political will. There's a great deal of, there's a great deal of distrust. Um, and an, an unwillingness to, to even to talk about things. Um, but the, the, the famous uh, example you will get in uh, Washington is that it's impossible to find out from the Russians how many theater nuclear systems they've got in, in Europe and, uh, and Eurasia. So is it 1,000? Is it 2,000? Is it five? Uh, if, if they won't even, if, if there is not willingness with one strategic actor to talk about existing inventories and capabilities, it's very difficult then to begin a conversation which looks at absolutely new territories where it would be important, perhaps essential, to know how far um, research has advanced. To reveal that is going to be militarily risky, it's going to be politically costly because one country may be accused of naivety. So the, the increase, the return to great power competition, which one sees since the end of the post-Cold War honeymoon, is inhibiting the, the sort of intellectual and um, technical effort that would be needed to come up with new strategic arms control solutions. That, you know, politics, rivalry are getting in the way. Well, the head of the Air Force Acquisitions, Paul, I'll stick with you for just a moment. He recently said that, uh, this is the U.S. head of Air Force Acquisitions, that China and Russia made hypersonic weapons a national priority and we didn't. And even the Pentagon, in an earlier review, uh, argued that the U.S. margin of superiority is now, quote, profoundly diminished. Why do you think the U.S. is lacking behind? Because it's not, it hasn't needed to be a game-changing uh, priority for America. They have an, a, enough other capabilities and they believe that overall strate strategic um, balances are stable. They haven't need to find, to look for some way of getting, getting um, a one-sider first mover advantage. Uh, now that may be changing. It, 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 from what I see, they're putting a lot more resources into this and they have options for use against China, conceivably against Russia. Um, so uh, what, what sh Watch the screens. You will Watch see more space, stories yeah. in, in the next two or three years about, a, about a, America catching up in this field, Let, which, was, which has always been a risk. I, mean, I think that the Russians were worried about starting what one argument you'd get within Russia. Let's not start an arms race with the Americans because they, once they go all in, they may win it. And that may now be starting to happen. Uh, Tarek Roof, what's your point of view on what the U.S. will do? How will they play on this Russian deployment? And, and President Putin said that this puts Russia ahead of other nations, and now they're playing catch-up. Is he right? Well, in the U.S. now, they are looking at investing in hypersonic uh, technologies, and there are small amounts of money that have been uh, approved in the defense budget. Uh, but the more risky thing is that both the Russians and the Americans are now talking about actual use of nuclear weapons, particularly low-yield nuclear weapons. In the latest uh, U.S. nuclear policy guidance, which came out in May, the U.S. talks about the use of low-yield nuclear weapons to restore strategic stability, and the Russians are talking about the use of nuclear weapons to end a conventional conflict in Europe, which is going unfavorably for them. So this is very dangerous, and at the moment there is hesitation in Washington even to renew the Reagan-Gorbachev agreement that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must never be fought, as there are some circles in the U.S. defense establishment that argue 
that a small use of nuclear weapons can, in fact, be carried out without uh, collateral or humanitarian uh, damage uh, by sinking an aircraft carrier at sea or so on. So not only, the, not only the technologies, but the rhetoric on both sides, but also China is increasingly. And we shouldn't also forget right. India what, what are here. China's, uh, what are China's to, uh, ambitions and tests when it comes to the space, Tariq? China conducted an anti-satellite weapon test a few years ago, which was roundly criticized internationally because it spread a lot of space debris. The Chinese feel that their arsenal is the smallest among the big powers, uh, that is, the Russians and the Americans, and that with U.S. missile defense and uh, uh, continued investments, their arsenal is becoming vulnerable to a U.S. disarming strike. And so that's what they believe, whether it's true or not, is another matter. And therefore, they are investing not only in their conventional forces, but also in modernizing and increasing the number of their nuclear forces. And despite the amity between Moscow and Washington, the Russians are very concerned that China may have more nuclear weapons than is generally believed. And also, President Trump has been openly calling for now to be trilateral discussions or negotiations involving China. Russia and the United States. Right. Pavel, do you envision some sort of trilateral treaty going on or happening in the near future uh, between the U.S., Russia and China? Uh, not, that seems right now not very likely because the Chinese practices uh, flatly say that they don't want to take part in any such talks and even less so uh, sign up to any treaty that's going to limit their capabilities or their uh, uh, nix their plans, and uh, Russia will not be pressing China to enter such negotiations. So that seems to be a dead end. I mean, uh, there can be talk about it. I mean, the Chinese are not even telling even Russians who are now, if not allies, but very close partners, how many weapons they have. At, uh, they're not giving any numbers at all. If Russia is not giving the number of tactical, non-strategic uh, weapons deployed, uh, Chinese are not telling about any kind of weapons they have. So to begin with, you have to have to know more or less uh, sure how much they have to begin to talk and, and bargain. And what that's, about other that countries, is not Pavel? happening. What so, about other countries? Uh, pa Pakistan, India, Japan. Um, are we looking at a multi-arms party race at some point in the horizon? It's uh, possible, though, of course, Japan does not have nuclear weapons, but uh, Pakistan, India, uh, Israel apparently do. And again, they're not telling how much they have. Uh, Tariq, though apparently, it's right. not that much. Uh, Tariq, you were mentioning a moment ago concerns about these weapons becoming actually operational. But there's also, as we know, concern about proliferation. For, for you, what's more worrying? Well, proliferation is happening. Unfortunately, Russia is collaborating with India in developing this BrahMos-2, which is supposed to be a supersonic and eventually a hypersonic cruise missile. Um, Japan has also been working on this. But given the recent uh, conflict between Pakistan and India, or India and Pakistan in, in February, uh, there is a lot of rhetoric coming out of both capitals about possible nuclear war. Uh, so South Asia can be a flashpoint on the other hand, both the Pakistanis and the Indians keep their weapons uh, not in assembled form and not on a ready-to-launch uh, status. But should hypersonics uh, enter uh, the equation in South Asia, there will be a lot of pressure to put their weapons on launch on warning and also to uh, uh, give command and control in the field to, to nuclear weapons, which would also be very destabilizing. Uh, Paul Schulte, for you, what uh, could potentially be the mo most destabilizing factor going forward? In the longer term, I think it's the, the wider spreading of these new technologies, which are not going to don't and they're not going to rely only on Russian or American technology. The the Indians will get um, uh, hypersonic cru cruise missiles. Other countries will get them as well. Um, so that that's. That spread multiplied by artificial intelligence, um, increasing the speed with, with some of these technical developments happening and the significance when they do happen, that, I think, is the bigger global problem. And we don't yet have an answer to how we'd even begin talking about that or who would be involved in that conversation. All right. Uh, on that note, I'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much to all my guests for joining us, uh, Pavel Felgenhauer, Tarek Rauf, and Paul Schulte. Thanks very much.
Thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can join the conversation on Twitter as well. Our handle is AJ Inside Story from myself and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.